structure of my company, I started it in 1999. We sold it in 2012 to a large private equity fund. Uh, the company was called ePrize. So we did online digital promotions for major brands around the world. Ended up with about uh, 500 employees worldwide, and we worked with 74 of the top 100 brands. Now that sounds all groovy, but it wasn't always so smooth sailing. Early on, for example, we had the chance to win some business from a very large company called Conagra Foods. And perhaps you know of them by name, but you'd recognize certainly the brands from their portfolio. Anyway, this huge company decided to consolidate all of their purchases of our kind of work, which was digital promotions, to a single supplier. We made it to the finals. So here's the scenario. Three companies left standing, my little tech company and two other giants in the industry. And all three of us desperately wanted this business. Problem is, the lead buyer, the decision maker, he was kind of a jerk. <laughs> no, actually, he was really a jerk. This guy was condescending and arrogant and difficult. I'm sure we've never had a guest like that, right? And furthermore, he was dragging the process out. All of us just wanted closure. Well, I bumped into him and his wife at an industry event. So boy, I'm trying everything I know to wine and dine him, trying to close the deal. Nothing's getting through. He was very standoffish. Next, I see him and his wife again at the airport. It turns out that we were all on the same outbound flight. So what happens next? Can't even make this up. This guy gets an upgrade to first class. He's a frequent traveler. So sure enough, he takes the seat for himself, sends his wife on back to coach. Just for the record, if I did that with my wife, like, game over. That's not happening. <laughs> anyway, again, can't even make this up. I also get an upgrade to first class, and sure enough, I get the seat next to him. So I walk on this flight, and, and I look at that open seat. He's already sitting down, and my mind is racing. I'm saying to myself, this baby's mine. He's going down. He's not getting off this flight until he signs a deal with me. But then I paused. In the same way I want to encourage you to pause when you're facing a decision, our instincts can, also, can often guide us in, in a certain direction, but those instincts can be misleading. In those pauses, that is our opportunity to let our imagination shine, to explore the possibilities. Is there an alternate route? Is there an unorthodox path that could yield a better outcome? Here's what I ended up doing. I wish I could say it was calculated. It was just because it was the right thing to do. But I walked on and I said, hey, I have this seat next to you. The guy looks up at me, cool, we could chat. I said, I'd love that. Problem is, I have a bunch of work to catch up on. And by the way, I noticed your wife is sitting in back. How about we switch seats? So this guy thanked me, and, but I saw something change in his eyes. Anyway, walk back and I find his wife and coach and I present her my first class ticket. I said, go sit with your husband, have a great flight. Well, this woman, she gets like teared up. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. This is such an important thing. I'm so happy to be sitting with my husband. I don't know why. <laughs> I was half expecting her to say, no, 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 it's cool. You keep the ticket. <laughs> so we take off. And I don't think much about it until we land. First thing we all do is check our mobile device. And I look down at mine, true story, and I see an email from my office. Josh, Conagra deal signed. Here's what he later told me. He said, I was looking for a tiebreaker. All three companies were solid and technically proficient. But when you exhibited a little humanity, instead of only lusting after the bottom line, he said to me, that's who I wanted to work with. This went on to represent over $30 million in revenue for our little firm in the next couple years. It was a big moment in our evolution. And again, it happened by taking this unorthodox approach that is accessible to us all. So I want to challenge you a bit this morning. No matter what your business card title may say, CEO of your association, vice president of membership, I think all of us need an additional title, an unwritten one, that of disruptor or business artist or innovator or entrepreneur. 
To me, these are the very skills that are needed to create real value, to create sustainable success for all of those that we serve. You know, you think about the world that we're living in today, and even though we've got a little bit of bump in the economy, we're still living in a world of massive transformation. Today, it's dizzying speed, exponential complexity, and ruthless competition. Nearly every industry represented in this room is in the midst of massive upheaval. And what we know for sure is that the rules of the game have fundamentally changed. We can no longer rely on the models of the past and expect to win. Today, we need to bring forth an entirely new approach, largely driven by innovation, by creative thinking. In fact, it's the one thing that can't be outsourced. It's our one source of sustainable competitive advantage. We think of innovation as the giant breakthroughs, inventing the light bulb or the automobile. Yes, those are innovative. But in that context, innovation only applies to a select few. CEOs, billionaires, inventors. But I'd like you to consider the concept of everyday innovation. In other words, little acts that you can do on a daily basis that over time lead to big things. Sure, they may not make the cover of a magazine, but they can drive real results in your business and for our patients. Everyday innovation applies to us all. More often than not, innovation happens as sure, there's an additional idea, but it's directional and probably deeply flawed. It only works through a series of micro-innovations that follow that initial idea, little adaptations, often through a series of setbacks and mistakes and failures that over time lead to real value. So this myth that we have is that there's an initial idea that is worth everything, and then after that idea, it's just mindless execution. That's not the way it works at all. It's more important how quickly you adapt than the potency of an initial idea. Example, a billboard goes up in Los Angeles. Your move, BMW, the entirely new Audi A4. Now, I believe this was a rhetorical question. Like the whole point of the ad is there's no way BMW could possibly respond to this cool new car. Except, BMW is an innovative company and they know how to adapt fast. Within only one week in the identical sight line to this billboard, BMW fired back with this. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Audi wasn't expecting that. But here's the cool part. Audi is also an innovative company. They also know how to adapt fast. So instead of crying foul or calling in the lawyers, only a couple of days later, on the very next billboard over, Audi responds with, your pawn is no match for our king. <laughs> this launches the Billboard Wars of LA. Both companies volleying back and forth, trying to outdo one another. And in fact, both companies won because they both knew how to adapt fast. If one of them didn't, that truly would have been checkmate. 